Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Good Hormone Health webinar for February 10, 2019. I'm Dr. Theodore Friedman. I'm very happy to be joined tonight by Dr. Shira Miller, who's a, uh, a, a functional medicine doctor and uh, an expert on hormone replacement. And she'll give a little different perspective than I, but we complement each other very well. Our talk tonight is new and traditional treatments for male hypogonadism. Um, the outline of tonight's talk will be, we'll talk about causes of male hypogonadism, how to diagnose male hypogonadism, testosterone replacement. We'll talk about the hormones HCG and clomiphene or Clomid. We'll talk about supplements for male hypogonadism, and we'll talk about diets for male hypogonadism. We do expect to have time for questions at the end, so please uh, stay with us and answer, ask your questions when it's over. There are four major hormonal axes. Um, from sort of the most preserved, the most important ones, the less important ones are the adrenal, the cortitrophe axis with CRH going to ACTH, going to cortisol. The thyroid axis, so the pituitary has the thyrotropes. The TRH is made in the hypothalamus, goes to the TSH in the pituitary to make T4 and T3. And the one we'll talk about today is the gonadotropic or the gonadal axis. GNRH is made in the hypothalamus. It goes to the pituitary to make LH and FSH and it goes to the testes or the ovaries to make testosterone in the case of men and uh, estrogen in the case of women. The growth hormone axis is very important. The cells that make growth hormone are called somatotrophs. It's regulated by GHRH from the hypothalamus going to growth hormone in the pituitary to IGF-1 in the liver. Uh, everybody, please mute your phones. Uh, the IGF-1 is the active hormone. And then you have the posterior pituitary, which makes AVP and oxytocin, and we've given webinars on those hormones in the past as well. Tonight, we're going to concentrate on the gonadal axis. The order of the pituitary deficiencies, the most common one, the first one to be affected usually, is growth hormone. The second one is gonadotropins, the FSH and LH. So they can be quite easily affected if the pituitary is damaged. TSH is the next one. ACTH is the next one. Prolactin is pretty well preserved. Posterior pituitary hormones are thought to also be pretty well preserved. Can everybody mute their phones if you're not muted already? Somebody has some background going on. The hypothalamic pituitary can have access starts in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH. It goes to the pituitary to, from the anterior pituitary makes LH and FSH. These hormones go to the testes that makes the lytic cells, make testosterone. The Sertoli cells make sperm and then hormone called inhibin. There is a feedback from the, the testicular level that inhibits the test, uh, testosterone inhibits both the LH, um, inhibit inhibits the FSH, and also testosterone inhibits at the hypothalamic level to inhibit the gonadotropin releasing hormone. Some of the symptoms of hypogonadism in men include erectile dysfunction, low libido, infertility, decreased muscle strength, poor endurance and stamina, fatigue, and depression. Some of the signs of hypogonadism include uh, soft testes, maybe one of the earlier signs a gonadotropin deficiency, small testes uh, certainly be a case, and gynecomastia, which is called extra breast tissue, tissue, is also one of the signs of hypogonadism. We divide uh, hypogonadism into three categories. Primary hypogonadism is a testicular cause. In this case, the LH and the FSH are high. This can be due to testicular surgery, testicular trauma, Klinefelter syndrome, where the male has an extra X chromosome, so it's XXY. This leads to low, um, low testosterone, a high LH and FSH. Chemotherapy often affects the uh, testes and you get a high LH and FSH, low testosterone type of picture. Radiation therapy to the testes for somebody that, for example, has testicular cancer can give you um, the high LH and FSH and low with, uh, testosterone. And orchitis or, or mumps is a, is a cause of it as well. 
The causes of secondary hypogonadism are hypothalamic and pituitary causes. This will give you a low LH and FSH. Uh, the one of the most common conditions is called Kalman syndrome. This is a, 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 a syndrome that includes low LH and FSH. The pituitary doesn't migrate properly. The patients cannot smell. They have anosmia. And this is a genetic condition found in men. Uh, you can have a pituitary tumor. You can have pituitary surgery or radiation to the pituitary. High prolactin, we could do the feedback reasons, gives low LH and FSH and low testosterone. And you can have hypothalamic diseases such as sarcoidosis or hemochromatosis that affect the hypothalamus and give you low LH and FSH, which gives you low testosterone. And um, so anywhere along the hypothalamic pituitary stalk, pituitary axis can give you a defect. You can have stalk lesions, hypothalamic lesions, and pituitary lesions. And um, about 10 years ago, we published an article showing that 25% of males with what were called, used to be called incidental lomas or micro, pituitary microadenomas, they had secondary hypogonadism. So one quarter of the people with these small tumors that people thought were benign and weren't doing anything did lead to low growth hormone in half the patients and low testosterone in a quarter of the patients. And uh, Dr. Miller has made me aware of this uh, somewhat newer category, well described in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2017, called functional hypogonadism. These patients have, for the most part, an intact hypothalamic pituitary testicular axes. However, they have still low testosterone. Their LH and FSH are usually pretty normal, so it's inappropriately normal. You think with a low testosterone, the LH and the FSH should kick in, it should be high, but the LH and FSH are particularly normal with a setting of low testosterone. In general, these patients, um, the benefit risk ratio is lower than in people with true uh, axis deficiencies, either a pituitary lesion or a testicular lesion. And these, uh, this syndrome of functional hypogonadism is pretty common. It's thought to be between 2.1 and 12.3%. And this picture here shows the prevalence. The prevalence of low testosterone can be up to 20 to 50%. The prevalence of symptoms of hypogonadism um, in this study here of community dwelling men was 20 to 40%. And there was an overlap of somewhere between 12.3% down to as low as 2.1% that truly had quite low testosterone, but it's pretty common, maybe somewhere around 10% of the men have this, synd synd this syndrome um, of uh, functional hypogonadism. And uh, the traditional causes of this functional hypogonadism would be things that, you know, beside, again, insults to the pituitary or the testes, these include aging, obesity, diabetes, opiates, marijuana, postfenesteride, this drug that's used to treat hair loss, can give people dysfunction of their uh, testy, testicular function and low testosterone steroids like glucocorticoids and also exogenous anabolic steroids. People that take testosterone end up with having low testosterone as a result of that. It could take several years for, before it recovers. And uh, Dr. Miller has came up with these other uh, uh, less common or more newer causes, um, and I'll let her comment on this. Um, uh, Shira, do you want to explain this slide? And you have any other comments about um, functional hypogonadism you want to add right now? Sure. Uh, do I need to press the reclaim host button or, or no? Um, yeah, I mean, we can hear you, I think. Oh, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. I think it should be okay. So the, the endocrine disruptors are, they're called POPs or persistent organic pollutants. Um, so that is a lot from uh, pesticides for example, in, uh, in foods um, or from products that are used um, either for cleaning um, or beauty products. Um, it, they're basically everywhere now in, in the environment. Um, and it's the, one of the theories for why uh, testosterone levels have been declining in the general population over the years is, is because of, of these persistent organic pollutants. Um, another one is stress, um, and the idea there is that stress increases the cortisol and that that um, interferes with the testosterone function. Um, then depression, I think actually this one, this study here is, is from UCLA, where 
uh, basically they found out that um, it, it could be that depression is actually causing the low T as opposed to the low T causing the, the depression, uh, which is another controversial topic. Um, there's definitely evidence that disturbed sleep or sleep deprivation, even in young men, um, can significantly decline uh, testosterone levels. Um, and this is from you know short term. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, um, I think that uh, that's also connected with the obesity, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to. But uh, the idea is that it, it actually, with the sedentary lifestyle, it, um, it, it, some, it, it actually depends on what you were doing when, when you were sedentary. So if you're sedentary on, on your computer, um, it, it might not be as low as sedentary and watching TV, uh, which, is, which is interesting. <laughs> Um, and then cell phone usage is uh, an emerging emerging cause. Okay, great. Now, testosterone has a circadian rhythm. This means that it varies throughout the day, and it's highest in the morning between 6 and 8 a.m. It declines in the afternoon, and it reaches its low around 6 p.m. at night. This is true in both men that are normals and men that have elderly men, for example, that have lower testosterone. So it's very important to get your blood draw for testosterone in the morning around 8 in the morning when it's normally high. If you get it low in the afternoon, it's supposed to be low, so you can't really tell if you're low or it's just low because it was drawn in the afternoon or you know, it would be falsely low if it was drawn at a different time. So it's crucial to get your blood drawn around 8 in the morning, you know, maybe up till 9, I would say, but no later than 9. And there's also a very important uh, concept to introduce is called the sex hormone binding globulin, or SHBG. This binds to testosterone, and it causes the testosterone that's unbound really doesn't do anything. Only the free testosterone form is active. So SHBG is low in obesity and diabetes or prediabetes. So if SHBG is low, the total testosterone looks low, but the free testosterone is really normal. So it's very important to you know, have an assay that measures the free testosterone because this effect of SHBG is quite common to be low in people that you're evaluating for uh, hypogonadism, the functional patients that are obese or have diabetes or prediabetes. So men with obesity or diabetes or prediabetes have a low SHBG, a low total testosterone, but a normal free testosterone. So how do you diagnose uh, male hypogonadism? I usually measure free and total testosterone at 8 a.m on two occasions. I like both of them to be low. You cannot make the diagnosis on an afternoon sample. If both the draws for the free and the total are below the range, especially the free, sometimes the total can be okay, but if the free is below the range, male hypogonin is likely. Um, anemia is also quite common in male hypogonin, so I like to get a complete blood count and look for a low hemoglobin. And hematocrit, if that happens, it's more likely to be uh, Hypo, uh, hypogonadism. I do measure a PSA at baseline and with treatment. If it's above four, I'm a little reluctant to treat as that means that the prostate's enlarged and the testosterone can often make it larger and raise the PSA, the prostatic uh, specific antigen. Um, we, I occasionally treat these patients with a combination of a medicine that I'll talk about later called finasteride, which blocks dihydrotestosterone. Dihydrotestosterone is what actually may, raises the, the um, the PSA, but I'm quite cautious if somebody has a high PSA and they might not treat them. So how do you determine between primary, a testicular problem, secondary, a pituitary hypothalamic problem, or functional hypogonadism? I measure the FSH and LH, usually try to do that in the morning, the same blood sample as the testosterone. If the LH and FSH are below the range, it's secondary or pituitary. If they're above the range, especially the FSH, it's primary or testicular problem. And I also like to measure prolactin. If it's high, it's also probably due to a pituitary problem. Um, if you have a normal LH and FSH um, and a low testosterone, it's the, this category of functional hypogonadism that we talked about. And if it really points to secondary, if you have a high prolactin, a low LH and FSH, I would get a three Tesla pituitary MRI to see if the patient actually has a lesion, a tumor, or a small pituitary, or something else going on in the pituitary that gives them the low LH and FSH and low testosterone. 
So this is a complicated slide from my job at Los Angeles County. I'm not going to go over it completely. But what we do is if a person has symptoms of hypogonadism, we get a morning total testosterone. If it's less greater than 350, it's unlikely they have uh, a, a problem. If it's between 250 and 350 or so, uh, we then get the free testosterone. The free testosterone is below the range. We look for the CDC and PSA. We look at the FSH. If the FSH is high, we're concerned about a testicular function. We would get a karyotype to look for Klinefelter syndrome. We then would get the, the morning values of the free and the total, FSH, LH, prolactin. We get thyroid tests that are not done, CBC and BSA. If the LH or FSH is below the range, we look for, a, we get a pituitary MRI here. Uh, we, if the PSH is normal, we would consider um, a rectal exam and looking for a high PSA. Um, we check a bone density frequently if the patient's older. We discuss the risk and benefits of treatment, and then we would start treatment here, which I'll talk about in a second. And this is another approach from this article in JCM about the functional uh, hypogonadism. If you have a young person, leaner, um, no comorbidities, specific symptoms, consistently low testosterone, it looks like it's true hypogonadism. Um, you look at the HP axis for pathology, and then you would start testosterone, especially if the patient does not want to have children. Right now, testosterone does uh, inhibit sperm counts. Um, so you, you might use other treatments if the, child, if the patient wants to have children right now. If the patient wants to have children in the future, it's very reversible. You could start the testosterone and treat and then stop it later. And then on the other hand, you have over here the patient that has more of the functional hypogonism. They're older, they're obese, they have other comorbidities. Their symptoms are less specific. Their testosterone is sort of on the borderline side. And here you would try, and Dr. Miller will talk about this a little bit, treat the reversible causes, lifestyle changes, weight loss, optimize comorbidity, stop drugs, such as opiates and glucocorticoids. And if they still have persistently low uh, symptoms and low testosterone, then you might treat those patients too. Um, and you always want to evaluate the risk and benefits of treatments, and you want to reassess is the treatment working or not after three to six months. So what are the treatments for hypogonadism? Um, in somewhat order of uh, maybe use, or at least we'll talk about today, um, we're going to talk about the top ones and the bottom ones. Um, the testosterone shots is what I usually recommend. Uh, traditionally, and I'll talk about this in a sec in the next slide, they're done intramuscularly or IM. I'm more, much more in favor, and I think the community is getting around to that as well, to give them by subcutaneous injections. Uh, the testosterone topical gels, androgel, it could be compounded. Um, they can be used testosterone patches. A buccal testosterone is actually on the, the paper that evaluated patients for buccal testosterone. Um, it's, a, it's like a gum-like thing that goes next to your, your, your gums in your mouth. Uh, it doesn't work too well, and there's only one dose of that. Testosterone implants, they, I'll talk about them in a second also. I don't think they're that great. And then HCG and Clomid, uh, Dr. Miller will be talking about those a little later. People ask me, what's the difference between testosterone cypionate and testosterone enanthate? Both are similar, and both need to be given by shots. There's no oral testosterone treatment. Cypionate is mainly used in the United States, and enanthate mainly used in Europe. Cypionate has a little longer effect than enanthate because it has an H carbon chain compared to a 7 carbon chain in enanthate. Depo is short for depot testosterone, which is the cypionate form. And the cypionate is probably less expensive than enanthate. So again, in using the United States, we and I, um, now the doctors, use the uh, cypionate primarily. Now, it's traditionally recommended that testosterone injections be given intramuscularly using a big needle that goes into the muscle, such as the buttocks or the shoulder. This is often quite painful. Patients don't want to do it by themselves. They might have a caregiver to them. Um, it's very inconvenient. It hurts. Um, and it used to be recommended to be given every two weeks. When it was given every two weeks, um, because the, they were so difficult to do, they had, the patients would have high testosterone levels after the injection and low before the next injection. This would be a little bit of a roller coaster effect. The high testosterone after the injection may lead to the prostate to get um, bigger and the lows before it. You don't really solve your symptoms because at least half the time you're sort of low testosterone anyways. So several years ago, I realized this and other endocrinologists realized this as well, that uh, the testosterone can be given subcutaneously in the stomach with a small needle that is just as effective as a larger needle. I usually start at a dose of 100 milligrams once a week. 
or 50 milligrams twice a week. I might start them on the 100 once a week for the first couple months and then switch them to the 50 milligrams twice a week. And uh, I recommend the 100 milligram vial, 100 milligram per mil, 10 mil vial. Often the pharmacy, for some reason, they have it hard to get this 100 milligram per mil vial. They substitute the smaller 2 mil, 200 milligram per mil vial. This is hard to use. It's hard, a little harder to dose. And it doesn't last as long as the 10 mil vial can be done. But I prefer people to get the 10 mil vial and I try to get them to tell their pharmacies to order it as I wrote for it. Uh, with the subcutaneous testosterone, I usually recommend two syringes or one syringe with an interchangeable needle. What you use for the injection is this one here in the center of the screen. It's a 25 gauge, 5 eighths inch syringe needle, and it's used to inject the testosterone in the stomach. I then get a larger 21 gauge, 1 inch needle, and you can get that with just the needle itself, like over here, or you can get this syringe. And then you take off the little one over here and put this bigger one on. Use the bigger one for drawing up the, the uh, testosterone and the little one for the injections. And it's very important to have the needles that come off and can be replaced easily. And it's very interesting. The, uh, there's the subcutaneous testosterone is um, now commercially available. Um, the FDA approved this use of an auto-injectable means you just like, uh, it makes it easy, very easy to inject. You don't have to draw it up. It's called Ziostead. And it is, first of all, it's testosterone enanthate. It's not Cypionate. It's once a week self-administration using a disposable auto-injectable. It comes in 50, 75, and 100 milligrams. It just got approved. I'm not sure how, how readily available it is now. Um, the one that's 50 milligrams comes as a half point five mils. It's around a $504 for a one month supply of two mils. So it's quite expensive. So I figure you just give the testosterone, the 100 mil vials, which are very inexpensive, give them the right needles and syringes, and they could do the same thing as, the, um, as this that's commercially available that did get FDA approval. So I think this is really showing the rest of the world is catching up with this idea about subcutaneous testosterone. And I'm gonna show this video of um, myself and a, a patient, um, about the subcutaneous testosterone.
So uh, that's on the YouTube, and it's also in the um, in the WebEx. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, um, Dropbox that has the same as the slides here. Um, so the other alternatives include testosterone patches and gels. Patches and gels usually do not achieve high enough levels, um, especially in obese men. They might be okay for an older person who just wants their testosterone a little bit higher, but in general, um, a younger person often needs the higher levels achieved by injections. Uh, with gels, you need to make sure not to contaminate women or children. Um, there is, as I mentioned, this buccal treatment. It's very inconvenient. It only comes in one dose. It's hard to have this thing in your mouth. It doesn't really work too well. Patches usually give a lot of skin irritation. Most people don't seem to like them that much either. Testosterone implants suffer from um, sort of like the same thing as every two week testosterone. You get high levels after the implants, low levels before the next implant. Um, you know, if an elderly person doesn't really care that much about the levels, it might be okay. But I would, I think, in general, this is not to be recommended. And once I put somebody on testosterone, I usually measure a morning again around 8 a.m. free and total testosterone about six weeks after starting the testosterone replacement. I try to measure it sort of midway between the shots. So for example, if you're on a weekly shot about three to four days after the shots, so or you take your shot on Sunday, you would get the blood test on a Wednesday. And if you're taking the twice a week shot, you would get it about two days after the shot. So you take your shot on a Monday and Thursday, you would get your blood draw on a Wednesday, for example. I usually aim for the free testosterone in the upper normal range. I like to make sure the hematocrit is less than 51%. If it's above that, we'll talk about what to do next. And I want to make sure the PSA is not rising and is below 4. So to get into this issue about dihydrotestosterone and estradiol and how you treat them, I have a different picture of the axis. And it's an important thing is to look over here. Testosterone gets converted to both dihydrotestosterone and estradiol. Both of these, if they go too high, are detrimental. So there's tricks we use to try to keep them low. So testosterone gets converted to dihydrotestosterone, which if high can lead to prostate growth and hair loss. So I try to keep the DHT in nor a normal range, less than 70. And if it's high, you can add finasteride. Finasteride comes in the one milligram pill, which is used for hair loss, and the less expensive five milligram pill, which is used for prostate problems. So I use the five milligram pill. And I usually have the patient take a half a pill of that two or three times a week. That usually works with just a very small amount. And then you look at the DHT levels after um, next time you're getting the blood draw for the testosterone to see if that's gone down. Another medicine I use commonly is called a Rimadex or an Astrazole. Testosterone gets converted to estradiol. High estradiol leads to breast enlargement and breast tenderness. And I usually measure the estradiol after starting um, the testosterone. If the estradiol is above 35, I would add a Rimadex, which blocks conversion of testosterone to estradiol. The usual dose is, a, uh, is the, the pills come in a milligram, and I usually give a half a pill about twice a week or three times a week or so, um, and that's usually enough also. So you really have very low doses of these medicines. It gets the estradiol down, the breast tendon is off and resolves. The breast enlargement will usually take longer to resolve. Some people have long-standing gynecomastia that need surgery, but the patients that have the testosterone, a little bit of breast enlargement and tenderness from being on testosterone, usually adding the Riminex helps with that. Patients on testosterone can also get a high hematocrit, and this is not good. If it's left high, it leads to blood clots and strokes. Um, a hematocrit above 51% is concerning. The best remedy for this is the patient to donate uh, blood to Red Cross, and there really are no restrictions on blood donations with one exception, which I think is unfortunate. Hopefully the law will change, but uh, uh, men who have sex with men, if the patient is on testosterone, um, they cannot donate blood. But otherwise, as long as you um, are not in this MSM category, uh, you can be um, you can uh, donate blood. The donating blood will lower your hematocrit. It's good for the society and it's good for your health. Um, testosterone is made by the testes. So when you take testosterone, due to the feedback, it leads to lower testosterone coming out of your own testes, and your testes shrink. Um, and some people are bothered by this. Some people don't, aren't bothered by this. Um, if you are bothered by this, there's a remedy for all this also. And it's called HCG, or human chorionic gonadotropin. It's similar to the pituitary hormone LH. And it could stimulate the testes that it could use in combination with testosterone replacement. The bottle comes as 10,000 units per 10 mLs. 
I usually go somewhere between 500 and 1,000 units three times a week to try to reverse this testicular shrinkage. And if it can be given on the day that testosterone is not given, so testosterone is given on Monday and Thursday, this can be given on Tuesday and um, Sunday, for example, or uh, Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday. So uh, this is a good thing to, to help prevent the testicular shrinkage. HCG is also helpful for fertility. So testosterone uh, inhibits sperm counts, and it's actually been used and tried to be used as a contraceptive. It doesn't work great as a contraceptive, but it does work pretty well in lowering sperm counts. So most people will not be able to get pregnant with, if they're taking testosterone, get their wife pregnant or spouse pregnant. So if a patient desires fertility, you replace the testosterone with the HCG. I usually use a dose, I stop the testosterone, use a dose of about 2,000 units three times a week. And I usually have the patients do a semen analysis about two months after starting the HCG. And usually the semen uh, sperm counts are normal and this mobility is pretty good. If not, then you can give them a little longer time and they may need to see a urologist and do procedures to harvest the, the, the healthy sperm and do that as part of an IVF treatment. Okay, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Miller now, who's going to talk about uh, lifestyle changes and supplements for functional hypogonism. Dr. Miller, do you uh, want to go ahead? Sure, thank you. So uh, we talked about um, one of the um, classic causes of hypogonadism is, is obesity. So overweight and obesity are associated with a reduction in total and free testosterone. And if you look at the BMI, so 25 to 30, that's the overweight range. Um, there's a 66 per nanogram, nanogram per deciliter uh, reduction. And then for obesity, which is the BMI over 30, goes up to 147. Um, and so, uh, conversely, weight loss can actually increase testosterone. And this is probably, you know, the most important, one of the most important slides here is, is because, you know, for the population in general, um, in overweight men and in obese men, um, weight loss does uh, significantly help um, increase testosterone levels. Um, and then, you know, surgical weight loss, you can see, is it's a dramatic uh, increase. Um, not that I'm recommending that, but it's just uh, more evidence that it's the weight loss. Um, and the weight loss also, so it improves LH function, testosterone, estradiol, and actual sexual symptoms. So uh, this slide should be very motivating uh, the, to lose weight if you need to, if, or, and body fat if your BMI um, is over 25, um, assuming you're not, uh, you know, full of muscle, uh, because that's controversial in terms of BMI, um, because you can have a high BMI if you're if you're all muscle as well. So we can go on to the, the next slide. So this again shows um, that the body weight loss is associated with the total testosterone increase. And these are all different studies. All the different circles are different studies. And the ones that are colored in or grayed grade, grade out, um, those are surgical weight loss. And uh, the, the um, hollow ones are um, dietary weight loss methods. Okay, so we talked about weight loss, <laughs> fat loss. I think I said it three times now. It's, it's really, really important. Um, now, in terms of nutrition, uh, you need to avoid a low-fat diet, and especially um, cholesterol is needed to make testosterone. Um, and there, there's different studies, some that indicate that it's more animal, animal fat that's important, there, but there's also studies that show that um, olive oil um, can increase testosterone. Uh, intermittent fasting. So you, so you want to be on a low carb diet primarily, or would you say that? Well, it, it's not, not extreme low carb. Okay. So I don't want to really, you know, overstress that. Uh, you, do, you do need a certain amount of, of carbs. Okay. Um, in terms of intermittent fasting, um, that's short-term fasting, not, not long-term fasting. Um, exercise, there's uh, weight, uh, resistance training, high-intensity interval training uh, can all help. Um, sexual activity, uh, competition, the studies there are um, uh, 
not good enough for me to put a reference basically, um, but it is, it is theorized. Um, sweating and detoxification, the theory here is that the persistent organic pollutants um, are, are basically interfering with, uh, with testosterone production uh, through by interfering with the hypothalamic pituitary testicular access and um, sweating can help get rid of the persistent organic pollutants in the fat basically um, avoiding scrotal temperatures that we've known that for for a long time and so you see the cell phones there there's the question of it if it's heat or if it's actually actually the frequency um, but definitely you know laptops hot tubs the heat we know definitely um, it decreases testicular function, at least in terms of uh, sperm, and there is evidence that it decreases testosterone as well. And with the, the cell phones, I had another study over there uh, initially, uh, there's a difference between just using a cell phone and having a cell phone anywhere near your groin area, basically a cell phone in, in the pocket um, type of, of activity is, was different. Um, the other thing is um, ultraviolet light, red light therapy. Um, there's some studies on that. And then sleep, of course. And a lot of this, you know, it's like uh, the, the, the cause is the cure uh, type of philosophy here. So we said, you know, sleep deprivation can lower testosterone. Sleep can, can increase testosterone. Um, and then there's uh, different types of drugs, marijuana, opio opioids, and glucocorticoids. You know, stopping any kind of drug that, that you don't need um, that can affect testosterone um, is a good idea. In terms of uh, supplements, uh, vitamin D supplementation, manganese, selenium, zinc, magnesium, there's all studies there. Um, there are some uh, herbal supplements that can improve uh, testosterone. Uh, levels like ashwagandha, ginger extract, pomegranate juice, garlic. There's the horny goat weed. Um, I, for, for, for people who are actually, you know, suffering and are in the low testosterone range and um, obviously symptomatic because they're, they're coming to see me um, or maybe not, I, you know, maybe I, I find it uh, incidentally. I usually don't reach for the, the herbal uh, treatments initially. I try to do a very comprehensive evaluation and figure out what's going on. Um, just because there is, a, there is the possibility, obviously, of an actual organic um, you know, primary cause of the hypogonadism, something wrong with, with the testes or something wrong with the pituitary. And so I prefer to kind of rule those out. And then once, if there is an actual problem, then I usually, you know, of course, I kind of, I, I do general supplementation, but I usually go for the sure thing, which in, in my world is, is the clomiphene, which we'll get to. Um, let's see, where's my row here? Okay, so, so clomiphene citrate is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which basically means that, that it interferes with estrogen, the, the negative feedback of estrogen um, on the hypothalamic pituitary function. So it's been used for fertility in men since the 1960s, but it's currently off-label because it was FDA approved in 1976 for women. Um, what's called n clomiphene citrate is seeking FDA approval for men, and it's basically very similar um, to clomiphene citrate, but um, they can get a, a patent on it. <laughs> because it's a little bit different. Okay, so David here is going to help us out. So if you look at the hypothalamic pituitary testicular function here, the red arrows show what happens with testosterone um, in terms of the negative feedback. So testosterone converts into estrogen, and that acts on the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And, and basically, uh, clomiphene interferes there with that function. And so, you know, this is how also estrogen interferes in general. Um, and that's one of the theories why, again, going back to obesity and persistent organic pollutants, um, xenoestrogens, anything that is estrogen-like can uh, cause the same problem of 
um, negative feedback on the hypothalamic pituitary testicular access. Okay, so for clomiphene citrate, uh, there's long-term safety and efficacy. As I mentioned, it's been used uh, since the 1960s. There are studies that showed improvement in um, the ADAM scores, which are basically the clinical symptoms, as well as bone density, uh, muscle mass, um, improvement in, in and improvement in blood glucose, insulin sensitivity. Uh, in terms of long term, right? That's that's a relative um, relative term. And the the last study that came out was in 2012, and that showed safety for three years. Um, so we have seven more years now, and I'm wondering if they're going to publish that. Um, but there needs to be, I think, definitely more studies on, on the long-term safety. Uh, possible side effects, so visual disturbances, breast enlargement, headaches, dizziness, exacerbation of psychiatric illness. This is mostly for people who are on some kind of psychiatric medication, and so that could trigger that. And then increase in PSA and estradiol. Um, and just, you know, what I want to say about this is the only one that I really, that I see, I, I, I don't see, I see two of these. So the main one I see is the visual disturbances. And I think in literature, it's, it's described as being rare, maybe 1%. Um, I, I would say that it's, I see it 10%. Um, and uh, when that happens, I, I need to switch the patient to, to HCG. And these visual disturbances can be quite subtle. So before I, I put a patient on uh, clomiphene or in the very beginning, I do ask them to go to um, have an eye exam and which is it's really just kind of to make sure because really it's not anything that is um, an objective finding. It's really a subjective finding that the patient, they, they feel something unusual in their in their vision and it's completely reversible once the clomiphene is stopped. Um, and Dr. then increase in, yes. Do you mean like blurry vision or? It, it can be, it can, it can, it can be blurry, but it's usually maybe like a, um, it, it, it's like a visual, some kind of abnormal visual sensation, or maybe there's something in there, they feel like they see something in their visual field. So it's, it's kind of hard to describe. Um, okay. And uh, okay, so then, so again, I talked about the comprehensive baseline uh, evaluation. That means a complete history, physical, um, comprehensive blood work, making sure there's nothing else going on, uh, growth hormone deficiency, thyroid uh, deficiency, um, different vitamin deficiencies that can interfere, like vitamin D deficiency that we spoke about earlier. So clomiphene citrate, it only works for secondary hypogonadism. And um, if I have a patient with uh, primary hypogonadism, then I basically use um, testosterone. Subcutaneous is definitely the way to go. Um, and and that's, how, that's how I've been doing it. With clomiphene, I start with a, a loading dose, so uh, 50 milligrams usually twice a day for three days and then daily for about a week. And then I switch the patient to 50 milligrams every other day. Um, sometimes I decrease it to 25 milligrams um, uh, every other day. This one says Q day, cause that's also possible. You can take it uh, every day. And, and sometimes, you know, there's studies showing that there isn't really a, a difference. And so sometimes it really depends on the patient if they, would just forget it if they would forget to take it um, because it's every other day dosing, then they can just take it um, every day. Uh, cycling is when you take it for, let's say, three weeks and then stop it for, for five days or so. Um, there's some evidence that that can help. Um, I usually don't do that type of cycling. Sometimes the main cycling that I do, it's not exactly cycling, but I basically test test um, a wean. So I, I basically, initially when a patient comes in, they're, they're, they're really suffering. And um, I would say that e even if the level is, is 400, which is, you know, not even um, according to the guidelines, right, you have to be like 350, less than 350. So even a, a man with a level of 400, um, you can see why I, I wouldn't want to put them on, on testosterone. 
but I do want to improve their testosterone levels. And so they're coming in and they're, they're depressed and they don't have motivation. Um, and it's kind of hard for them to do anything. And so clomiphene is really good to, to, to help them feel better for a while. And then once we kind of fix everything and they um, are more motivated to, to, to make the changes, then we can try to, assuming that there isn't any other uh, organic cause, then we can try to wean off of it and see what happens. And so I, I do do that, especially with, with younger, um, younger men, you know, I, I, I try as much as I can to kind of do a follow-up testing so that they don't necessarily have to be on it for, for a long period of time. Um, or for the rest of their life, I should say. Uh, but I also, there is also selection bias in terms of the patients that come to me. Um, so if, if they have to continue it, then then that's just the way it goes. Um, I do do the follow-up uh, in terms of estradiol and PSA, CBC, um, dihydrotestosterone as well. And then, as I mentioned, the visual changes. Uh, the really good thing about clomiphene citrate is that I, I never get an increase in, in hematocrit. I just, I don't get to those levels at all. So um, not to say that I don't recommend donating blood uh, because that's good for, for other uh, reasons in terms of uh, decreasing the ferritin. Um, however, I, I think that that's a, a really good benefit to uh, using clomiphene citrate as opposed to testosterone. Um, and also with the PSA, usually it's, it's if there's an underlying issue is, if, is, that, is when I see a PSA increase. Um, and, and usually that involves a workup. And I don't necessarily stop the clomiphene, um, but, you know, the patient does have to go to a urologist and, and get an MRI. And we do, we do different things to try to lower the PSA, which is sometimes can be um, a matter of just figuring out what's causing the infection if it's not a malignancy. Next slide. Okay, so other uses of, of clomiphene citrate. So you can use it um, as an alternative to HCG for testicular shrinkage, also for infertility. There's a lot of studies showing uh, the benefit of clomiphene citrate. And then when you're transitioning um, from testosterone to HCG, um, you can also use clomiphene citrate. Um, the, to avoid the, the heavy crash that can happen. And so, and sometimes I, you know, I have to use HDG to get a patient off of testosterone um, to help, even though I, I know that ultimately, or I hope that ultimately they're going to be fine just with the clomiphene citrate. If they're coming off of testosterone, I do give them HCG for that transition because that can be, uh, it can be pretty brutal. Um, to just switch from testosterone to, to clomiphene. And then other uses of HCG are for clomiphene side effects. That's the main one. That, that's the main reason I use HCG in my practice is for, as I told you, I have maybe 10% that have the visual symptoms. And so I do have to use, uh, you know, something else. And it's, uh, HCG is, is the go-to for that. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Miller. It was a great job. Hopefully people found... Uh, or talk very enlightening. So we are going to open it up to uh, questions now using the chat button. Um, the, we'll take people sort of as they come one at a time. And uh, if you have more questions afterwards, uh, you can email me if you want to make an appointment. Uh, go on my website. The last page allows for appointments. Um, you can, uh, I will post the webinar on my website, and Dr. Miller will post it on her website in the next couple of days. Um, you can contact Dr. Miller at her website. Uh, Dr. Miller, you're not accepting new patients right now? Um, or you might be? Yeah, I might be. I, I usually can take, you know, if it's a, a patient or two um, most months. So Great. And Dr. Miller's office is in um, um, Orange Newport Park. Beach. Newport Beach. Okay. So please go ahead and ask questions on the chat button. Um, we'll open it up to everybody now. Uh, Tom H's uh, zone diet. Um, you want to explain what the zone diet is, Doctor uh, Mr. Tom? 
to the Barry Sears diet? Correct. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know it that well. I understand it sort of approaches Atkins, but it has some carbohydrate. I understand that, uh, like myself, uh, Dr. Sears has some heart challenges. Right. I tried to read some of the stuff, and honestly, it got a little heavy for me. Right. Uh, so my thought, again, on diets, I'm in favor of a fairly low carbohydrate, uh, high vegetable diet. Uh, which I think is what Dr. Sears advocates. Um, I do not advocate a really high high fat or a low fat. I guess a moderate fat diet with a lot of um, um, things like um, olive oil and avocados would be reasonable. Um, and I think basically uh, the diet should be uh, to get you to lose the weight, low calories, uh, high vegetable diets. Uh, Dr. Miller, you want to add anything to that question? Yeah, I mean, ultimately it's it's the calorie intake um but you know you need to, you need to have enough uh enough fat in your diet to, to actually make the hormones mm -hmm. uh, robert asked how can how old can a patient be with clomiphene um dr miller you want to answer that yeah so that's a that's actually a really great question because i when i first find out found out about clomiphene i i didn't uh I didn't think that it worked at all in, in, in men that were like over 30. Um, and so when I when I found out that um, that it did, then there, there there wasn't really an age limit. So there isn't. So if you have secondary hypogonadism, there isn't an age limit. And the, and the, my colleague um, that actually told me about it, I think he was 80. So <laughs> um, uh, that's how I found out about it, just from a colleague who was right. taking it. So I think there's two issues. One is testosterone does decline with age. So I wouldn't expect um, a testosterone to be 800 in somebody who's uh, 80 years old. So you have to sort of take that into account. On the other hand, elderly people suffer a lot from, you know, muscle weakness, loss of muscle mass. And they, they're the ones that might benefit the most from a medicine like clomiphene. There's a sort of a big debate about giving testosterone to elderly men. Um, I, I think in the patient with a low testosterone and um, and symptoms, I think it would be appropriate to give somebody clomiphene. Yeah, I mean the other issue though is with with I would say older men or elderly is that there can become uh, what's called basically primary and secondary. There, it's mixed. It's not just secondary. So. Um, it, you know, it's not necessarily that it's going to work, but it's definitely worth checking that, you know, the FSH and the LH. That's why you always have to check the FSH and the LH. Yeah. Uh, Peter asks, I am a six-year-old male diagnosed with low thyroid. I'm taking uh, Armour Thyroid 45 milligrams. Since starting, I noticed my free T is out of range. It was recommended I keep taking the, it's out of the range low, sorry, out of the range low. Um, recommend I keep taking the thyroid, but I have most of my symptoms. My total T is about 430. So again, I would recommend mostly looking at the free T, make sure it's in the morning, uh, make sure it's low twice. And I think if it's low, you should go on testosterone. Um, and I think you would benefit from that. Uh, Janet asks, if somebody has sp uh, low spermatility, it is likely that testosterone is low. So people with Klinefelter syndrome can have um, uh, have, have basically no sperm or very little sperm. And your testosterone is often low, but often not that low. So this might be a hint that somebody has, uh, you know, a sperm problem has low testosterone. Um, there's a lot of causes for low sperm motility that are not testosterone mediated. So, um, you know, when I was a patient, a, a fellow at the NIH, we had this guy who worked like a pizza oven and he had low, low testosterone. So there, low sperm count, excuse me. Um, so there are causes. I think it's be, important to evaluate both um, the testosterone levels and the sperm counts in the motility, especially if the person's interested in, um, in fertility. Um, Liz asked, my husband switched from androgel nolan and cover insurance to compounded T and um, seems more depressed. Could the compounded T be responsible? Maybe it's not as strong. Yeah, so I think it's very important to uh, check his levels, especially check the free testosterone levels. The compounded may or may not be as formulated as well as the androgel. Um, and it's important to follow the levels on that to make sure that they're sort of at least in the mid range, if not the upper range. Um, um, uh, Shira, if you want to chime in on any of these, you can, but uh, I think these are sort of more a little bit of endocrine questions. So 
I'll keep on answering, but go ahead. Uh, Arthur asks, what can be done for older men with normal T but low free testosterone because of SHBG high? So SHBG wi varies widely. Um, in general, high is good. Low SHBG is more associated with obesity and diabetes and insulin resistance. So if somebody has a high SHBG and also assuming their thyroid tests are normal, then uh, and they have low testosterone, I would say um, you can treat them with the testosterone. Um, there is not that much you can do to lower the SHBG. I'm not sure you want to particularly. Um, boron lowers it, uh, as I, um, some, um, there's some other supplements, but I think that if the testosterone is low, you can go on testosterone. Uh, Bobby says, Dr. Miller said, clomine was inexpensive. How much should I pay for a 25 milligram pill? So, so not Clomid. I think Clomid actually can be more expensive, but the generic, which is Clomiphene Citrate, um, I think that's running right now at like $40 for, for 30 pills, which is basically like two months supply. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, relatively inexpensive. Okay, I'm not sure what Robert says. Psycho old me, maybe he can rephrase that again. Uh, Robert says, you mentioned prostate cancer. I read that testosterone therapy helps reduce the prostate. No, so um, anti-testosterone therapy is used for prostate cancer. So things that block testosterone, finasteride, for example, those medicines uh, that block testosterone are used for prostate cancer. Pro testosterone itself stimulates the prostate. James says, I am a veteran with PTSD for a long time, especially my hypothyroidism, hypogonism is related to stress that I endured today's presentation so brought that may be true. So cortisol does lower both uh, testosterone, suppresses the whole hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Um, somebody with PTSD like uh, James may have high cortisol and that may lower it. I don't think it's a huge effect, but it may be enough. And I think certainly Arthur should, um, James should try to get treatment for his PTSD as I presume he is. And also if he needs to, should go on testosterone and thyroid replacement. Art asks, uh, I've been taking testosterone shots bi-weekly for two years. I am hypopituitary. My reading is 700 after one week. I'm in my 60s. Is that too high? I'm very fatigued in the afternoon. Could that be for my testosterone level? So I probably also want to see a free testosterone you, but 700 seems you know, on the high side, but not that horrible. Um, my guess is you may have other hypothalamic or pituitary deficiencies. Um, that should be checked, including uh, growth hormone, thyroids, um, um, things like that should be looked at also uh, to maybe giving you some other causes of fatigue besides your testosterone. Dr. Miller, do you want to answer that question? I think also exercise, diet is crucial. The one about cycling Clomid, is that what he's asking? Yeah, well, it, you, know, well, you can ask about Art's question about he's still tired in the afternoons, um, even though his testosterone level looks pretty good. Um, yeah, so this is why, you know, the, there's a comprehensive evaluation um, would be worthwhile to figure out um, what else is, is going on there. But I think that, uh, you know, over 700 kind of uh, leads you to believe that it's not the testosterone, it's not a testosterone right. issue. So then, then Robert asked about cycling Clomid in older men. You want to address that, uh, Dr. Miller? Um, so I don't know what, what, how are you defining? I don't know if that you're defining, but I think in any in any man that has that is using clomiphene, um, you know, depending on what the cause is, um, you can try and and cycle it. So, and I I would say I think that there's there are studies that show that that cycling can Im help in terms of fertility, especially. So um, it just depends on what your goal is. Um, with the cycling, because cycling is, sometimes you can uh, what's assumed to be develop a resistance to the clomiphene, um, and so that's it doesn't really happen. I think because it, it is administered every other day um, as opposed to every day, but you can um, you know stop it for five days, let's say, um, and then restart it to see if if you have uh, more of a benefit. Okay, Ronald says, what's the average cost for testosterone therapy monthly? I think it varies a lot. I think if you get the testosterone in the 100 milligram per mil vials, it might be about $30 a month. 
I don't think it's uh, that uh, high. Um, there is one one yeah. thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. Um, in terms of the the levels, um, you know, I think it's kind of controversial to look for like one level as as the cutoff, but obviously you know, the, the standard of care right now is that it needs to be less than 350 um, nanograms per deciliter. And I know that there was a, a Swedish study that came out in, in 2011, and they followed almost 2,500 elderly men. Um, and they basically found that the men who had a level of more than 550 nanograms per deciliter, they had a 30% less risk of, of cardiovascular events. So um, there's definitely, you know, evidence showing that um, it's not it's not just about um, you know sex drive and mood, although those are important, but there are actual mortality mm -hmm. um, measurements Great. and benefits, I would say, to optimizing testosterone levels. Um, Janet asks, I'm confused about the recommendations to the, the Barry Sears diet. Are there high protein? Diets, low carb diets for weight loss. I am primary vegetarian, eat unrefined carbs. My weight and BMI are normal. I am a fan of a pit. So, you know, I think in general, people's diets can vary. Some people need to lose weight, especially in the context of tonight's talk. We're talking about people that are overweight, they're with central obesity that's contributing to their hypogonadism. Um, in general, I, th I think most people, many people, eat too many uh, processed foods and too many carbohydrates. Um, refined carbohydrates, if you want to use that term. Um, and we're trying to encourage people to cut down that and eat a lot of vegetables. So I think what you're doing is eating, you know, some grains, um, um, vegetarian type of diet. I think that's reasonable. Um, I don't think you have to start tonight eating uh, meat, um, but I think you'll go, you'll do quite well with uh, your diet you're on. And the men that are on this call that um, eat, um, you know, lots of vegetables, not much refined foods, um, They'll do pretty well. Dr. Miller, do you agree with that? Yeah, I and I, I generally recommend, um, you know, a, what's called the Perfect to Health Diet. Have you read that book? No. Um, it's pretty good. It's the, the Gemini's. They 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 go through um, basically a complete analysis of a lot of uh, nutritional recommendations, um, and it it doesn't espouse low carb necessarily although of course you know you can't be you know eating um refined uh carbohydrates so and there's basically what are called the safe starches that you just have to have a, a limited amount but the, the most important thing i would say is to um avoid low fat okay for testosterone yes <laughs> okay matt asked about growth hormones so growth hormones really another topic um that will either have a webinar on. I think I've done some webinars on growth hormone. Um, recently, we did one on the stimulation test for growth hormone and talked about growth hormone in general. So um, people with hypopituitism, they have to low testosterone and low growth hormone often together. And in general, you need to be treated with um, both of them. Um, in general, testosterone does raise IGF-1. So sometimes if you take the testosterone, you will help with your growth hormone. Um, the other way around, growth hormone does not affect testosterone, but testosterone does seem to raise IGF-1. So uh, we're a little bit past seven, so let's uh, call it a night, and uh, we'll post the, uh, the webinar shortly. I thank everybody for participating, especially thank Dr. Miller for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, bye-bye.